is celebrating its 16th birthday. I first constructed it in 1977 from my home in Kitsilano after visiting the Queen Charlotte Islands, visiting the artisans and the people in the village of Masset. Uh, my friend and also fellow artist Hannah Lohr was on the visit and we planned a salmon festival to be held in the Charlottes with the children and the families in the Queen Charlotte Islands. My first ideas on the construction of this salmon was really a giant windsock. I love the windsocks that the Japanese made. And the idea was that each of the scale of the fish was a three color variation. So I sat in my uh, stitching room in Kitsilano and stitched hundreds of scales. Each scale in the fish is a slight variation between the shades of pink, blue, mauve into purples. And then putting in a few plastic windows here and there so that you could see in. And the children and families inside could look out. So this windsock went to the Queen Charlotte's in 1977 for a Robert Davidson celebration for the first totem pole that was raised in a hundred years. And this was the anniversary of the totem pole raising. After I came back, I realized that it would be much more flexible and stationary if we designed a fan to be able to inflate it. And this fabric is uh, coated with silicon, so it's water repellent. So this 100% nylon keeps the water out, but it's not totally airtight. So we constructed fans from uh, furnaces, a squirrel cage fan from a furnace, and therefore it was inflated. The salmon itself packs into a pillowcase, it's really portable, and the little fans that we use now are only about 24 pounds, and also very portable. So that this salmon has traveled in many, many countries from its early origins in 1977 to date. And this year it's celebrating its 16th birthday. It's, six, it's Sweet 16 Haida Salmon. And it's going to be showcased at the Surrey Art Gallery in an exhibition honoring the salmon from September till November of this year. The salmon has traveled along the Pacific from Alaska through Polynesian islands of Hawaii, Samoa, Fiji, on to Australia, Adelaide, a number of exhibitions in Adelaide Festival Center, and then down into near Alice Springs area with the Pichinjara people, the desert people. Then on to New Zealand, across to Hong Kong and Edmonton for a giant university ad in 1983, Expo Vancouver 86, and Brazil, the last journey in 1993. So it'll be revitalized, new costumes are being added and uh, new stories are being told. Salmon was first the focus for a dance. I was inspired by the Haida culture and H Hannah Lore Evans wrote the story and then composed the music with a composer in Toronto, David McClay. Well, the salmon dance is a West Coast story. It's about frog, eagle, raven and bear who uh, are West Coast characters. They live around the water, and they're very important to all of us in, in British Columbia. Um, Evelyn has made this nylon 50-foot salmon, and uh, the dance characters will come out of it. It'll be a process of birth. And um, they'll meet a human being along the way and teach him how to dance. The salmon swims upstream from the deep waters of the sea. He enters the river's bed. The salmon swims upstream, drawn to a place at the end of which is also a beginning. Check 
against him briefly. All around him, they leap with joy. They are small. They are silver. They are quick. The young ones are the river flowing to the sea. Deep water. 
waters is still strong, it is lightened by partial exposure to air. A creature of two worlds is born, part land, part water. The frog is always changing, always trying to cloak a clumsiness. The frog likes to sing, he likes to sing in the spring. The frog likes to dance, he likes to dance in the water and the trees. A shred of memory leaves the salmon shell. It is the memory of leaping with the shimmering young ones. It is the memory of spring.
on a rock in the river, he winks from the feathered arms of the cedar tree, always changing, always borrowing, Raven wears a coat of many colors in the white of snow. Raven's voice is everyone's in thin winter air. Raven's voice is all the colors of the world. Beautiful, beautiful lodge that they have. It's made out of wood, and, and you know how beavers are, right? They're always 
like maybe, you know, touch it or walk through it. And one of the men did. And he heard this gurgling and splashing sound. And the other man came back and he had this big salmon. They cooked it on the fire and they ate it. Raven had never eaten salmon at that point and he thought it was the most delicious thing he'd ever eaten. He wanted to know if there was more, but the men didn't answer his question. So Raven hung around for a while, talking to these guys and getting to know them. And, and they had a feast almost, you know, every day of salmon. And each time one man would start a fire and the other man would go through this picture in the wall and come back with a big fish. Well, Raven was getting really curious about how they were doing this. They weren't exactly telling him what was happening. And then one day, the men, they transformed themselves back into beavers. And they went out chopping, out chopping down wood in the forest. But they wouldn't talk to Raven anymore because, well, beavers can't exactly talk to ravens. So Raven decided while they were out working away, cutting down trees, Raven would see what this mural was all about. So he went up to the wall and he touched it, but it was, it was solid. He couldn't get in. He was trying to find a way through this picture to go where one of the other men had gone before. And then he remembered, each time that they had done that, one of them had started a fire, and then they could walk through. So Raven built himself a little fire there, and then he looked at the painting and he saw it start to shimmer. And it kind of, it kind of got really soft and he walked into it. And when he walked through this painting, he discovered he was in a completely different land. There were lots and lots of lakes and rivers and streams, and in all of them there were salmon just jumping and hopping all over the place. Raven saw all this and was just, he was pleased at all of this, but he thought he wanted to bring some of this land back with him. But how was he going to do it? He tried to pick up a whole bunch of salmon, but they are real slippery, right? And he kept dropping all of them. Raven didn't know what to do. And then he kind of went over to one corner of the, the land there, because it was like a painting, right? And he kind of looked at the corner there and he sort of lifted it up and he realized that he could roll up this land and take it with him. So he lifted up the corner and he rolled up all the land. He tucked it under his wing and he walked back out. And before the, the beaver men could get back, he walked out of their house and flew back to Haidogwai. And as he was flying, a little bit of the corner was sticking out and he was dropping some of the fish and some of the water. But he didn't drop enough because when he got to the, the islands, he opened it up again and there was just enough fish and lakes and rivers for, for the islands there. And ever since then, we've had salmon. Did you like that story? Yeah. Yeah. So now you know one way of how the salmon has uh, come to this land here. All right. Um, the Squamish people, you've heard of a place called Squamish, right? River. Yeah, the Squamish River. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a people called the Squamish. And they, um, th long, long ago, they didn't have salmon either. And so they, um, they decided to find out about them. Because they'd heard from people traveling around that they had, they'd eaten salmon, this wonderful fish. And one day, these four brothers came visiting. And these four brothers had had some of this salmon. And the Squamish people said, hey, um, can you, can you somehow, you know, talk to the salmon and convince them to come to our village sometimes so that we can have salmon too? Because, well, we're, we're poor people. And they weren't really poor, but sometimes they didn't have enough food. And the four brothers said, well, it's going to require a lot of, a lot of strong medicine to do this, so, you know, maybe you can come with us and give us a hand. And so they went out into the forest and they gathered a whole bunch of herbs and things like that and plants, special plants, and they made some very special medicine. And they paddled out in their canoes way out into the ocean until they came to an island. And it was a really strange, unusual island because all along one side was all this charcoal, you know, like burnt wood floating in the water. And it looked pretty solid. And one of the people in the canoes got out to walk across this to the island, and he sunk and drowned because he was trapped underneath the charcoal. They couldn't do anything for him, so they decided, well, we better go around the other side of the, the island there and see if we can land someplace else. So they paddled around the island, and they saw a beach there, and there was a village. And they went to the village, and they discovered that these people that lived here were the salmon people. Well, the four brothers, you know, when uh, natives greet people, they have a big feast, and so they had a big feast first. And after several days of having a good time eating and having a great party, one of the four brothers,
brothers asked the chief there. Since you're the salmon people, our friends, the Squamish people here, they'd, they'd like it if you'd come and visit their village sometimes and, and you know, um, give, you know, give some of your salmon to them. Well, the salmon chief said, well, we can, but there are some very important rules. You have to remember to do this very properly and just right. Otherwise, the salmon will never come back. And so they said, well, tell us. We'll, we'll do it. And the big chief said, well, this is, how, this is what we'll do. And he got a couple of his people. He said, you people go, and, uh, go up the river there. And these people got these special suits on. And they walked into the water. And just as the water went over their heads, they turned into salmon. And they swam up the river and they swam back. And the big chief pulled them out of the, the, the water. And they ate the salmon. Now, after they ate the salmon, they very carefully collected all the bones and put the bones in the water. And they came, became fish again. And that's what the chief told them. He said, anytime you eat salmon, you have to be very careful to put the bones back in the water. Because if you don't, they'll never come back. Or if they do come back, they won't come back just right. And they did this for a couple of days. And one of the brothers got curious. He was, you know, he wanted to see what would happen if he kept one bone. So they had another feast and he kept one of the bones. He hit it. They put all the bones back in the water and nobody noticed they had done that. And the salmon came back and they transformed themselves back into people. And they walked back up onto the beach. But one of them kept covering his face. And when they uncovered his face, they discovered he was missing his nose. And that was because that one brother had kept the bone. And the chief said, somebody has kept the bone, we gotta put it back in the water. And one of the brothers said, oh yeah, I must have forgot about this one. Pretending, you know, like he didn't take it on purpose. And they put the bone back into the water and his nose came back. Well, the chief said, remember, you'll see what happens if you don't put the bones back. So the Squamish people went back and the chief told his salmon people to go and visit the Squamish people sometimes because, well, they knew the rules. They would put the bones back. And ever since then, there have been salmon in the Squamish River.